Chairing, my name is Cynthia Enlow, and I'm chairing the session on mass atrocities, international policies, and post-conflict developments, dilemmas, <laughs> dilemmas. Um, uh, our first speaker uh, will be uh, Yanez uh, Yansha, um, who is uh, twice former uh, Prime Minister of Slovenia. Um, he has been uh, active in politics since his early days and uh, a member of the uh, independence movement of Slovenia, spending time in jail for his principles. Um, he is currently um, uh, the very active um, member of the Responsibility to Protect and Genocide Prevention um, Movement. Uh, he chairs the Institute for Cultural uh, Diplomacy's initiative on the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have him here with us today. Well, <clears throat> thank you very, very much, first of all, for this kind introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm privileged, I feel privileged that I will take the uh, next few hours of your time. Uh, I prepared a uh, well, PowerPoint presentation from my experience, I realized that sometimes uh, helps not to be too asleep when somebody is too long. But Cynthia promised me to, to be strict on time, so don't be worried too much. The origins of genocide and responsibility to protect in uh, 21st century is something which is as actual as it was uh, well, centuries ago. And uh, it uh, had taken centuries before first uh, definition of what genocide is was adopted in the uh, United Nations or uh, and it was agreed among the international community. The Genocide Convention, definition of genocide said that genocide is a certain act undertaken with the intent to destroy in whole or in substantial part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. If you see to this definition, we see from the big distance that uh, it's not complete. This definition was a result uh, of the international relations after the Second World War, and uh, it was uh, adopted in the United Nations uh, at the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, some more words about uh, this problem emerging from unsufficient definition later. Well, when you're speaking about uh, genocide, different people mention different cases. I'm still, I think, I think not able Nobody here in this hall is able to count all of the cases, unfortunately. Some of them are well known, some of them are well neglected, forgotten. Uh, we can count many such proofs and cases, uh, the acts of genocide uh, made by European colonial powers in Africa, for instance mostly neglected. Armenia is known case, Soviet Union known case, but still disputable. Holocaust, the most known case, uh, which also triggered the uh, international action, and uh, the Holocaust was the most important motive for drafting, for the Raphael Lemkin, who drafted the uh, Genocide Convention. Yugoslavia, 1945-1946, big case of genocide, but very much neglected. I will speak about it later. 
because it uh, repeated after decades exactly because it was neglected. China, tens of millions of people were eliminated by different things. Rwanda, Bosnia or Srebrenica, this was a case of genocide repeated because the genocide in former Yugoslavia after the Second World War was hidden under the carpet. Darfur, still going on, Eastern Congo. When we <coughs> looked at the genocide, uh, Convention definition of what the genocide is. Gender was not mentioned. Systematic rapes committed in Eastern Congo is something which is not uh, covered by this convention, but it is act of genocide. Uh, I promise you to try to describe the motives for the genocide. Why genocide happens? What are the origins of genocide? How it is possible for someone to persuade a group, a large military unit, a political organization, to commit such a big crime? This is uh, well, the question repeated many times to the human history. How it is possible? Well, for ancient times, we know some answers. Roman legions destroyed many tribes in Europe and in the Mediterranean area because they didn't want to surrender to Roman law and pay taxes to Rome. It's well known, it's written history. <coughs> Genghis Khan eliminated many towns during his rule in China, in Central Asia, because he ruled with the help of fear. He destroyed one nation. And he said, this is example for others. If you don't split to my rule, you will be exterminated and uh, it worked. He, he uh, created a vast empire based on fear. But all this happened centuries, millenniums ago. What about genocide committed in 20th century? Or genocide that happened 18 years ago in Srebrenica, in the middle of Europe, six years after the fall of the Berlin Wall? after the big changes in Europe, in the heart of the European continent. Well, next few minutes, uh, I will take you with a video clip from the film, which is called Soviet Story. It's a film taken, a documentary film, which was pictured in 2008. Maybe some of you already saw the whole film. It is uh, speaking about some origins of genocide. The, the clip is quite shocking. Somebody will, maybe after that, when we start discussion, consider it as controversial. But nevertheless, I suggest to see it. I don't think many people know that um only socialists publicly advocated genocide in the 19th, 20th centuries. I guess that's a very little known fact, and, and it seems shocking to mention it. I've, I've lectured on it here and in other universities, and it's always, always greeted with a sense of shock. First appeared in in January 1849, in, in Marx's journal, uh, Neue Zeitung, Engels wrote of the, uh, how the class war in Marxian terms means that when socialist, socialist revolution happens, the class war happens, uh, there will be primitive societies in Europe uh, two stages behind because they're not even capitalist yet. And he had in mind the Basques and the Bretons and the Scottish Highlanders and the Serbs. And uh, uh, he calls them racial trash. Folk uh, up racial trash. 
and they will have to be destroyed because being two stages behind in the historical struggle, it will be impossible to bring them up to the point of being revolutionary. He spoke about the vulgarity and the uh, dirty, dirtiness of, of Slavic people, you see. And uh, he thinks, for instance, that Poland had no, no, Poland had, had, has no reason to, to exist. The classes and the races, too weak to master the new conditions of life, must give way. They must perish in the revolutionary holocaust. Karl Marx. Marx began it. He was the ancestor of uh, a modern political genocide. And I don't know that any European thinker of the modern period before Marx and Engels ever publicly advocated racial extermination. I can't find anything earlier. So I presume it starts with them. The teachings of Marx and Engels were carefully studied by Lenin, the man who established the first Marxist country on earth. One year after Lenin's death in 1924, the New York Times published a small article, which at the time went almost unnoticed. It was about some newly established party in Germany. The National Socialist Labour Party, of which Adolf Hitler is patron and father, persists in believing that Lenin and Hitler can be compared. Who's speaking? A certain Dr. Goebbels. On the speaker's assertion that Lenin was the greatest man, second only to Hitler, and that the difference between communism and the Hitler faith was very slight, a faction war opened with whizzing beer glasses. Amazing. The future Nazi propaganda minister Goebbels was openly declaring that the difference between Lenin's communism and the Hitler faith was very slight. As we read, it didn't go down well with potential voters, so the Nazis changed their tactics. Their early campaign posters quietly disappeared. They never again publicly stressed their resemblance to communists. In the inner circle, however, the Nazis and Hitler were more outspoken. Hitler often said that, uh, that he had learned a great deal from Marxism, from reading Marx, I mean. Uh, the whole of National Socialism is based upon it, he said, meaning doctrinally based. You must all know half a dozen people at least who are no use in this world, who are more trouble than they are worth. Just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you can't justify your existence, if you're not pulling your weight in the social world, if you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then clearly we cannot use the big organization of our society for the purpose of keeping you alive, because your life does not benefit us, and it can't be a very much use to yourself. Bernard Shaw believed in, the, in um, mass killing by category, not usually by racial category, but by category, you know, the idle, the unfit. Killing off the parasites within society was what Marxian socialism was about. It demanded in a, in a London newspaper that the scientists should devise a humane gas. I appeal to the chemists to discover a humane gas that will kill instantly and painlessly. Deadly by all means, but humane not cruel. After 10 years, such gas will be discovered. Do you know for this statement of Bernard Shaw? 
the 99% of the people currently living in Europe <clears throat> didn't hear for it. Uh, this is also the reason why genocide in Srebrenica happens. In July 1995, the United Nations Protection Force represented, represented on the ground only by a weak uh, Dutch battalion, battalion of Dutch peacekeepers failed to prevent the town's capture by the voice of the Republic of Srpska, Army of the Republic of Srpska. And after that, uh, in a few days, the massacre by the Bosnian Serbs of more than 8,000 civilians and prisoners, Bosniaks, mostly <coughs> men and boys, happened. Uh, this is a well-known case. When it happened, the European newspapers reported that uh, this was an uh, act of extreme nationalism. It was an act of the nationalism, but not only this. Uh, people were killed and uh, women and children were expelled from the Srebrenica and other so-called safe heavens under the protection of the United Nations from Bosnia because the uh, General Mladic and his lieutenants thought that with the ethnic cleansing of this territory they will be ruler, ruler, ruler of the Bosnia. So they used this method. And the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, declared this act as a genocide. When there was 10th anniversary of this massacre, the Secretary General of the United Nations described Srebrenica as the worst crime on European soil since the Second World War. But this statement was not correct. As I said before, from May 1945 to November 1946, more than 100,000 people were killed in former Yugoslavia, also Bosnia, by Yugoslav communists. More than 100,000 people. <coughs> After the democratic changes in Slovenia, this was only a small part of former Yugoslavia, maybe 8% of the whole country, they found over 600 burial places on an area spreading over 20,000 kilometers popula populated by 2 million people. And among those burial places, many are considerably larger than the ones in Srebrenica. But they don't exist in the conscience of the Europe and of the world. The victims were prisoners of war, civilians who didn't want to cooperate with the regi regime, and many, many other groups, also religious groups included. Why is it important to confront the statement of the Secretary General of the United Nations, which was spoken in Srebrenica? Precisely because Srebrenica happened for the reason that Europe and the world forgot such massive and unpunished killings in the former Yugoslavia after the Second World War. So the sad history repeated exactly after 60 years partially on the same places. General Radko Mladic, who, was, uh, who is still considered as a mastermind of this genocide, they were the end products of Yugoslav communist and military ac academies, which taught that the essential objective of the class struggle or armed conflict is physical destruction of the opponent and that the class struggle is still something which is, uh, which fits also to the 20th century, to the modern times. So this was not 
the act which was produced of the situation on the ground, it was the act which was planned, which had ideological background, which had educational background. Uh, so, it is very false if we uh, consider those acts as only extremely nationalistic. We should, we should uh, measure them in their complexity. This was just the junction of nationalism and extreme ideology. In this junction, the national socialism was produced and was repeat, repeated, and this is why it's so important that we don't neglect some cases of genocide uh, that we are just when we are judging those cases. It's very important that uh, we have the same measures, and it's very important that we don't forget. And it's also very important that we don't apologize such a crimes uh, with any kind of the ideology of the, any kind of color. Unfortunately, this is still, this is still the case. So I have one or two minutes for the second. <laughs> you are very strict for the second part of. of uh, the lecture, how to prevent genocide in 21st century. First uh, condition is to be aware of everything what has happened in history, not to be aware just of the one part of the history. The second, second, the second thing we, we need to prevent genocide is to, uh, to fight strictly against, against racism, against all totalitarian ide ideologies without exceptions, exceptions and against all militant religious concepts, without exception. And the most important tool to do this is education. We know we must know what has happened and why. We must know the reasons and consequences. We have to be aware of, of what is currently going on in Sudan and Congo and Syria, and we have to care about that. And we have to, to help to the governments who are sincerely working to improve the world order. And we have to link together the energy of the civil society with this uh, official energy, if I say so, and to join forces to upgrade the international order. When Polish lawyer Rafael Lemkin, after the Holocaust, after the Second World War, started with his work to, to introduce, to draft, and then to get enough support in the United Nations to adopt this still valued genocide convention. Uh, well, 99% of all people who, who knew him thought that this is totally utopistic project. Totally utopistic project. But he succeeded. Not immediately, but after some years. When Institute for Cultural Diplomacy five years ago uh, launched first discussion when we discussed these issues, uh, I remember, Mark also <coughs> remembers, in the audience there were big skepticism. Also when we run next discussions with the uh, law, international law experts and other people, there were all uh, skeptics. It's not possible, the international law is rigid, there is veto, and so on. But now, after five years, after we introduced this idea 
uh, to the United Nations to the uh, last session of the General Assembly of United Nations in September last year, things are slowly starting to move. Things are slowly starting to move. We joined our forces with the R2P concept. We, we have no time to explain it, but uh, Mr. Johansson did this at the beginning, uh, all these three pillars which are uh, constituted the R2P uh, con concept. And uh, I think that within the next few years, if we enlarge this uh, network of uh, civil society organizations, if we really enlarge this uh, governmental network of the focal points of the R2P concept, if we work together, we can make enough pressure uh, to the governments, also in those countries who are not uh, taking this issue seriously, among 106, uh, 160 speakers last year on the General Assembly meeting, I think there were only five of us who really mentioned this issue because of different reasons, many others just uh, avoided it. But uh, we see during last year that when we are speaking with the leaders, when we are making the, the push when we published this initiative in the International Herald Tribune, then the support came. People say, oh, well, maybe we, we, we can do something. So first thing is, and I'm concluding, is not to be silent. Not to be silent about history, not to be silent about current cases of the genocide and mass atrocities and, and ethnic cleansing and all conflicts where especially civilian population is suffering. So such conferences are of great importance. And the second uh, thing is to join forces. There are millions of people who want to do something, but well, they, they are just watching the TV news. They are asking themselves how it is possible that nobody is reacting. And next day, they repeat the same sentence. So we have to give them tool, we have to give them uh, opportunity to do something. And I think that uh, within, I, I'm not, uh, well, I'm considered a realist, I'm not considered uh, optimist. So I don't think that we can move things and we can pass the leg legally binding resolution of the United Nations, which will upgrade the current uh, genocide convention. Uh, within this year, it's not possible. It will be a big success if we succeed that Secretary General of United Nations will uh, mention this possibility in his year's report on this issue. So far, nobody really proposed such things. It was considered as, as totally utopic. And then on this basis, next, next year and year after that, I think we can come into formal circles with uh, first draft of this resolution and start to build support. When the support uh, in civil society is reaching certain level, it is not possible for the government to neglect it. I've been prime minister for two terms. I know this from both sides. So we have to, to make this pressure. We have to make uh, alliance as big as possible. We have to use this uh, R2P responsibility to protect concept to join the energy of the civil society and of the governments and of the international institutions and to move forward. And uh, this conference, I consider this conference as one important step, which is maybe not very visible currently, but after years when we have uh, mission completed, uh, it won't be forgotten.
Thank you very much.